Hey, Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode. This is a very special episode. I got Dr. John Leaf here, somebody that I just discovered like literally three days ago, uh, the secret language of cells. All right. Right now it's August 13th, 2021 on Kindle. This is only $3.99. That's $3.99 to get a crash course basically on the body. I mean, that's the way I haven't finished the book. I'll be honest with you, Dr. Leaf, but I'm reading it slowly. I'm not like going through, I'm going slow page by page. I'm a slow reader anyways. But what I've, the reason I bought this book and I'm going to introduce Dr. Leaf because it's amazing. We're going to have to do part two and three, because this can go on forever. I, I'm in clinical research. I always tell people in our industry, Hey, Look, at the end of the day, we're in the field of science. So, yes, I understand SOPs are important and FDA regulation, a 1572 form. You got to know all that. But at the end of the day, what are we doing? You know, it's about science. It's about discovery. You have to learn a little bit about this stuff. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the minutia of of research without actually understanding the science. And if you want to be a generalist, you got to have a working knowledge, more holistic working knowledge. Like you got to know what's T cell, what's B cell, especially in the era of COVID, guys. Now, all of a sudden, Dr. Leaf, everyone's an expert on viruses. Everybody. Okay, so uh, we got Dr. John Leaf on. He's the author. We got links to the book underneath the video. And if you're listening on the podcast in the show notes, founder of Searching for the Mind. He's a neuropsychiatrist from Harvard Med School. He also, as an undergrad, majored in math from Yale. Those are two rivals. How do you feel about that? The dichotomy there. The the rivalry is in, within you. Which one I do you often, identify with more, Dr. Leaf? I often say I went to the best medical school and the best college. Ah, okay. Okay, I like that. I like that. So but there's a lot we got to talk about, but and I know that introduction's not, it doesn't do you justice. Can you give us just like a little one minute crash course on your career so far leading sure. up to the book? Um, yeah, I, I'm a neuropsychiatrist who treats um, complex patients who have combined medical, neurological, and psychiatric disorders in hospitals and in specialized uh, brain injury programs, which I've run many. And I've run large systems and introduced this integrated care over many years. I've run many hospital programs. And uh, at one point I was running uh, hospital programs that serviced uh, 250 nursing homes in Massachusetts, the largest system for geriatrics. Anyway, I so I pioneered programs for geriatrics and for brain injury, uh, became the president of the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, founded the journal, et cetera, et cetera. And I've just spent my life seeing patients, learning and uh, studying. And uh, then my one of my true loves is because I deal with medically medical patients who have mental issues and mental patients who have biological issues and neurological issues, I could see this complicated interweaving thing of the body and the mind that supposedly is a dichotomy. And I became very interested in what is the mind and where is it? And I started a, a website where I reviewed the scientific literature. And I guess, you know, people would ask me, do I speak foreign languages? You know, as a clinician, and I would say, yes, I do. I speak molecular biology and molecular genetics because they really are foreign languages. They're, they're filled with incomprehensible jargon, the names of receptors and uh, signals and genes and uh, transcription factors, blah, blah, blah. And I realized no one, even in fields close to each other, can understand even closely allied articles. And the titles of the articles, you can't search them because they involve all these receptors' names. So I began to translate these articles into English um, on my website. And I viewed myself as translating major review articles from gobbledygook jargon into English. And I did that for many years. And then 
I, I wrote a lot about neuroplasticity and the brain and, and neurons and dendrites, et cetera. Yeah, but then I became interested in animal intelligence. I wrote a lot about uh, birds and uh, elephants and, and then smaller and then bees and insects, a remarkable intelligence in ants and termites and bees. But then I was fascinated by uh, microbes, how smart they are and how much they can do. And I started writing and I have many posts on my website. You can Google that about uh, bacteria um, and but also viruses and how amazing their lifestyle is. I wrote articles about Ebola and HIV and varicella and COVID and various things. And um, the and then it became apparent to me that all cells are signaling each other, not just, and, and, and I began to write about the skin cell, the cancer cell, the, um, each of the brain cells. And at some point it, it became apparent to me that all of biology works through signals, that it is all a conversation, that it's not what we used to think, you know, if you're studying the kidney, that you would just go study a kidney cell. You can't do that. You have to study the capillary cell, the neuron, the immune cell, the T cell. They're all talking. Even the microbes are talking as part of that conversation. And, um, and the, you know, for many years, people knew microbes were very important, but they, and they influence us, but no one could to give a simple reason why that was true. And uh, what what dawned on me is that the reason microbes are so influential is that they, they speak the same language as our cells and that all the kingdoms basically speak the same language of shape-fitting molecules and cascading responses to signals, uh, et cetera. And that that's the reason that they, and, and very recently, I, I write about how signals have been, I always thought viruses were very smart because th their lifestyle is so elaborate and they tackle these highly complicated T cells that are amazing cells and they influence the cell, take over the cell. How can a little strand of DNA or RNA do that? And um, I always felt that they had more to it. And then about four years ago, the first signals among viruses were found. And now there's a whole field of signals between viruses. Now, we discovered the signals of microbes 30 years ago. And only now is the science good enough to see the results of that. So it's going to take a while before we understand the signals of the viruses. But it's a very interesting subject. So I've kind of blabbed on beyond your question. But uh, <laughs> anyway. I mean, I'll listen all day long. Do you, you need a podcast? Do you have a podcast? You, you need I a don't, podcast? but maybe yeah, you should have one. Okay, I'll help you. Help you. <laughs> Look, uh, this is an example I sent to my dad. He's a psychiatrist. I'm going to introduce you. He does research also. So this is a quote. I don't know if you guys can see this. Here's oh. a quote I got. So this is what I do. This is what people do, Dr. Leaf. If they read on Kindle, you can highlight and share it to like Instagram. And people oh. were already messaging me like, oh, I'm going to get that book right now. So look, oh. this is a quote I sent my dad, who's a psychiatrist. He researches this stuff too. I said, neurons also communicate with brain waves. This is what, what Dr. Leaf, this is a, a clip I found interesting. Do you know where I'm about to go? Neurons also communicate with brain waves. Groups of neurons vibrate together, sending particular frequencies of electromagnetic oscillations as messages to other brain regions. For messages between two primary brain memory centers, one frequency provides spatial information about the memory, and a different frequency supplies time-related information. Right. This is amazing. Like, we just discovered this, or, uh, I mean, why don't people well, talk about these things? We've suspected it, but I also talk about the fact that neurons communicate in many other ways. They send sacs filled with information to astrocytes, to the myelin cells, they signal through unmyelinated regions sideways to T cells using cytokines. Um, they probably use nanotubes. We know ca cancer cells use nanotubes, microbes. They're there, but we haven't really found out how. But it, all the cells that use exosomes seem to use nanotubes to communicate also among the cells. And they probably, uh, you know, they use electricity through these open connections of the electrical synapses. Somehow the electricity is going back and forth and the, and the neurons can make sense of that. 
so for example, in, in the astrocytoma cancer, um, very smart cell, astrocytes tend to use these electrical connections and this cancer makes many connections to all kinds of neurons and steals the energy, the electrical energy from, from the neurons. So somehow they understand a free flowing set information of electricity also, and probably the field around the neuron. So they're communicating in many ways. Obviously we know the synapse with the neurotransmitter and we know what you just read. We know that, yeah. uh, but they communicate in many ways and probably most cells do also. There's a couple of things. So from that, so, and, and I'll explain to people why I like another reason why I like the book, but you just said something I want to ask. Astrocytes are very smart cell. How can a cell be smart? Do they have consciousness? What's going on here? Well, when I say smart in this context, I mean cells are making decisions from multiple inputs and are behaving in various ways that we could colloquially call smart. The truth of the matter is we don't know what smart is. We don't know what consciousness is. We have no definition of intelligence. We have no definite, like, the, the reason why I expanded from my studies of the brain into, into animals, insects, and, and microbes is because there is no brain center for consciousness. There is no, we have no idea what subjective experience is. And yet, and many scientists want to say, well, therefore, there is no subjective experience, but that's obviously stupid. We know we have subjective experience, and everyone knows that. And so we have to have a science that somehow includes subjective experience. And right now there's none, zero. So we are ending up with a situation where in my book, I don't talk about these issues except as questions in the conclusion. I basically describe behavior mm. and, and then people can draw their own conclusions. But it sure appears to me that they're smart uh, from what they're doing. Uh, astrocytes determine all the synapses. They build them, they maintain them, they prune them, they, they create a web, huge network that where they have thousands of neurons connected that they are, where their fingers are connecting. They're the ones that determine the blood flow. Uh, they're sending food to the neuron. Um, the astrocyte network is vast. And this whole idea of deciphering the brain through the connections of the vast connections of neurons is impossible without the network of astrocytes also and the network of myelin. So it, there's, there's never going to be a, a satisfactory conclusion of the connectome theory without including the almost equally complex network of astrocytes that have their own way of signaling through calcium oscillations. They have a whole different way of signaling. And, and as a neuron signals, the astrocyte has calcium oscillations that are that are related to it. We don't understand it yet, but it's clearly related to the actions. But the astrocyte starts the synapse first with an electrical. By the way, synapses start with electrical synapses, uh, and then they build on top of that in the fetus. And even they can't live without each other. So you have the electrical, the chemical, and you have the astrocyte. I mean, most people who study synapses now include the astrocyte. I mean, you can't have a synapse without an astrocyte. I mean, it, it, so right. it, it's part of the connectome, whatever you're going to call it. You, you, having you on as like a podcaster's dream because we can go a hundred different places. And that's why I think we're going to need a part two and three. And if you, if, Absolutely. No, if I'm or to... when you write another book for sure, but just this book alone, I want to talk about why I bought it. And then I want to segue into why Harvard Business Review listed it as a business, but one of the top business books and Drucker. Uh, but here's why I bought it. Trying to grow my YouTube channel, and it's been working. Instead of just doing clinical research stuff, I've been trying to do, trying to cast a wider net. So this actually, this interview is a, a part of that strategy, although this one's like me. I just wanted to interview you. But I started reviewing biotech stocks because those are very popular on YouTube, penny stocks. Well, the science behind, if you look under the hood of these biotechs, if you take finances out of the way, because they start doing funny things with the warrants and all that stuff. But if you just look at the science, it's fascinating, like the innovations that are coming out there and the speed that's coming out. It's no longer like 
anything special to do like one thing. You need to have a platform now, like a platform that's multifaceted. So I was like looking under the hood of these companies and said, look, I need to up my science knowledge. It's not enough. I need to understand this to be a better YouTuber, to be a better investor, to be better at my job. Harvard Business School ranked your book in the top. I don't know what. Can you explain what and, and then why they considered it a business book? Well, I was kind of surprised when Harvard Business Review was one of the early people praising the book, as well as Peter Drucker's outfit, naming it one of the best business books of the year, the five best business books of the year. Um, but the Harvard Business Review basically had been reading my website and then saw my book as well. And they they said I was leading uh, that, that well that many of the f more famous authors writing neuro books are following my lead that we don't understand consciousness and that uh, and that um, and that cells are talking throughout the body that there's no separation between the immune system and the brain for example most of the research has been done with immune but as my book shows the capillary cell the platelet cell i mean crazy platelets are intelligent that's like mind-boggling really that's what harvard medical school was fascinated by when they reviewed my book they talked about uh the platelets they were really struck by the platelet chapter uh, so the capillary and platelet chapters are really mind-boggling to anyone inter interested in, you know, medicine or biology, things like that. But what they said is that, well, what Harvard Business Review said is the idea that there is that the body is the brain is dramatic. Uh, and Peter Drucker's group said the same thing. They said that the holy grail of science and research and business is intelligent cells mm -hmm. uh how do you understand the intelligence of a cell and what it's doing so my book spells out many aspects of how cells appear to be smart uh and lead to uh future research uh but it you know as i said it, you used to just research one little area now you can't it's more complicated but at least you know where to look so at least you look for the cytokines you you have to look for the the whole range like the capillary section is amazing because aristotle said that the blood vessels create the organs you know he just invented this you know <laughs> who knows yeah. aristotle you know, you know way way back and he was right actually it turns out everyone thought he was completely insane uh, modern people. And, and so as the data came out, it's the capillary that tells the stem cells sitting right in a little niche next to each other, what to do, like when to make new cells, what kind of cells to make, how to differentiate the cells, the capillary sending this, these signals to this, to the stem cell. And there's all these little capillary beds, like in the liver, there's a the sinusoids in the lung. There's all these unique little capillary structures and always right next to them is the stem cell niche. Uh, and so that's important. I mean, that's yeah. important for research. That's important to develop things. Uh, so if someone could go after the signaling of the capillary and the stem cell, there's a lot there. I mean, there's the, that's a business, uh, you know. So that's I guess- a platform. You know, that's a platform yeah, for a biotech. There's a lot. <laughs> that's one of a thousand leads, I think, in Do the Do you book. know of any biotechs looking at capillaries, like into the research? Not well known that's why if people read the book they'll be ahead um, right i don't know why i well i do know why it's because the jargon destroys so you know if you ask any scientist is signaling important so of course signaling is important you know and they're dealing with one set of signals and one set of receptors and they're doing one you know the glutamate receptor you know blah blah, blah. Uh, but they won't it, there's nowhere you can look this is why I wrote the book, because I didn't see anywhere where people are just understanding that signaling is it. That is the basis of life. And it used to be the definition of life was, a, we don't have a definition of life. Zimmer wrote that great book recently about how every theory of what life is, is wrong. You know, you say, well, they, they reproduce, but a neuron doesn't reproduce. That means it's dead, uh, you know. We don't reproduce. Are we dead? I mean, you know, once we're past that age. So the question is, what is life? Well, we've always defined it as a reproducing cell that has metabolism, basically. But now, if you take that narrow definition, which I don't think it's adequate, and he shows it's not adequate, 
uh, because viruses, you know, many scientists think viruses aren't alive, but that's because they're looking at the spore part of it, the part that just floating free, not the t part of the lifestyle where they come in and create a virus cell and take over the cell. And uh, so they, to me, they're alive. I mean, and, and the virus cell is very much alive, but it's still a cell when the virus is in there. And then this is like a signal and a transfer and a communication when it's traveling freely. But um, the idea of, to me, now the definition of life is a cell that has metabolism, reproduces, and signals and is able to communicate with other cells. Mm -hmm. That's a vital, that's an absolutely vital part of the, and that's why Ray Kurzweil liked the book because it, it raises the whole question of information. It shows that information transfer is the fundamental basis of life. Has it's he reached wonderful. out to you? Or, um, yeah, he's on the back of the cover of the book. I saw that. I saw that. So did yeah. he like find your book randomly like I did? or like how did... No, he was aware of my work. Okay. Okay. And then okay. when the book came out, he read it and, you know. <laughs> I Another reason I like the book is it kind of explains a lot. Like you talk a little bit about acupuncture in it, I think in the capillary chapter. And... I haven't finished it, but I'm guessing just from the quote I read about vibrations that the people who are big proponents of meditation are onto something. I like how it kind of explains Eastern medicine. Well, the, the most important chapter for that is the chapter in the brain section on uh, pain and inflammation. And ah. let me just describe this. So one of the very important discoveries in the past number of years, and, and something that I emphasize in the book, and I don't think is emphasized everywhere, are that everyone knows about neuronal circuits, and now neuronal astro, astrocyte circuits. I mean, that's pretty well known. Um, but what is new is what's called neuroimmune circuits and neuroimmune reflexes. So, for example, in the wild, animals learn that certain things will trigger and help or hurt their immune system. And that's a neuroimmune reflex. And that can be trained like a Pavlov's dog. You can train T cells to behave better, ultimately using a colored liquid, just the way Pavlov did about other things. Now, how does this work? Well, it works through the fact that there are circuits that are completely new and we have no definition, we have no way to define it in our current terminology, but they include neurons, astrocytes, microglia, um, skin cells, T cells, even microbes are, cr are creating a circuit. And pain has these elaborate neuroimmune uh, circuits, which is why I, it's in that chapter. So the two things that come up are acupuncture and meditation related to the neuroimmune circuits. And the way it works is this. Um, everyone knew I mean, it's obvious that acupuncture works for some things. You press uh, something in the wrist and it affects the kidney. Right. I mean, we know that that's true. And the question has always been, how can that possibly be? Because in the West, we always think it has to be an energy conduit of some kind that you're triggering. So we, we would naturally think it's near a blood vessel or a nerve. And that would be the logical Western way of viewing it. It turns out it's not. So they did a study where they triggered an acupuncture point with electricity and then had the effect in the in the spleen, this was study. And what they found is that what was happening is that it was triggering a T cell in the tissue. And that T cell became activated, traveled near a neuron, signaled to the neuron, and sent the signal around to the spleen. So it involves these neuroimmune signaling circuits. Um, so ac that's... That's proven for one. I mean, I'm not saying that's the only definition of acupuncture, but it makes sense to me that it would be. And there's so much communication going on between uh, T cells and the brain, in which I can talk about how they create the sick feeling, how they affect uh, new neurons in the memory centers. And we can talk about that in a minute. But this idea of the... Um, so, and how does meditation... Well, everyone knew meditation affects the vagus nerve and calms the breathing calms the heart rate calms the gut and the vagus nerve has a relaxing parasympathetic effect on those organs but no one knew until recently that neurons can create every aspect of 
immunity, every kind of inflammation. They can increase or decrease every, they call it neuroinflammation now. And it's a whole science. And neuroinflammation can create local, localized infections. They can cure localized infections. They can create generalized infections. So they create the various kinds of inflammation by communicating with, and it used to be thought they could make, you know, the four symptoms of inflammation or heat, uh, you know, et cetera. They used to think it would just be one, but now it shows how they can do all of the symptoms. So the vagus nerve in the spleen and other places affects the immune system through the meditation. So what's happening is that by meditating, and this is like Pavlov, it's a conditioned reflex. So as you meditate, your immune system gets better and better. And this has been proven. I mean, I have an article uh, on my website shows, you know, through measuring cytokines, it's not like hoopla, you know, that they don't get cold. So I'm saying that, that you're measuring cytokines, you're measuring the amount of genes, uh, you know, it, it triggers 200 genes in the immune cells, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just mention one other thing before I forget the connection. So T cells, no one ever thought T cells were in the brain, and they aren't, except under rare circumstances. But they are in the cerebral spinal fluid, which no one knew, which is right near the brain. And no one realized that the cerebral spinal fluid is not just a cushion, but it's a conduit of signaling. And the choroid cells are vital relays between the body and the brain of signals and the very well, like one part of the brain will signal i need help it'll go to the choroid cells they will send to the capillary cells they will call for specific immune cells but at any point in time there are about a half a million t cells in the cerebral spinal fluid and they're signaling to the neurons in the brain so when we get sick the t cell is the one the t cell is sending a signal all the time we're okay we're okay when we get sick they change that signal to no we're not okay we need the sick feeling and this is what creates the sick feeling where you lie down, you get a fever, you need to, you need to protect the body that, so it can heal. Turns out that T cell is also signaling for making new neurons in the memory center. There are about a thousand new neurons every day in the nose and the memory centers. And the new, new memories are associated with the new, uh, uh, the new neurons that are made. And then they gradually outlive uh, the uh, old memories and take over. And, and this is also why you can use that with reconsolidation and traumatic experiences by using the new memories to make new, uh, add a little bit of love to the new memory. Um, but when we get depression, the T cell says make less memory cells. And that's what creates this fog that creates the brain fog. When we have Anxiety. So, so when you're sad or depressed, you li your body's literally telling itself to uh, slow down on the neuron production. Right. Stop thinking so much. Uh, stop. Uh, and so when we have short term anxiety, actually, it increases the memory a little bit. But when it stays a little bit longer and it becomes chronic anxiety, it's like depression. We get less and less new memory cells wow. with the stress. And that's the, that's the brain fog of that stress. That explains a lot. So as yeah. a psychiatrist, I mean, I know you studied your specialty, I think, was dementia from what you were saying, Alzheimer's That's dementia. one of them, uh, brain disorders, yeah. What do you think about schizophrenia and these kind of <laughs> – these? Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in schizophrenia. And I know this – like, I'm not a clinician. This may sound really dumb. But I always tell my friends and now my colleagues – because we do a lot of we do a lot of schizophrenia research, I always tell them, "Hey, look, what if they can actually see something we can't? Like, what if they're tuned in and we're not? Like, what well, do you think about this? Like, how does this relate in the context well, of?" It is shown that there are hallucinations that are not dangerous and are not schizophrenia. Some people have hallucinations or visions. I also write about visions. So there are a class of people that have hallucinations and visions that are not schizophrenics who also have the, some cognitive uh, difficulties and various. Schizophrenia is an extremely complicated situation that we don't understand. Right. It involves hundreds of genetic markers that uh, involve all kinds of aspects of the neurons and the, uh, and the astrocytes and the um, the white and gray matter, all of it. And it, we just don't understand it. But what one thing I can tell you is when the drugs came out and the hoopla around the drugs curing schizophrenia, which they don't, of course, 
although they were extremely helpful. And I, I became a psychopharm expert, you know, in the new uh, drugs. And I used to lecture widely on that. But the fact of the matter is, the old, old way, ancient use of psychotherapy in schizophrenia was very helpful. And when the drugs came out, they said it's all biological. They had stopped uh, psychotherapy. And now it's shown clearly that if you want to support a schizophrenic, you need psychotherapy and outreach. And those are very, very important for the functioning of schizophrenics. We don't have a cure yet. We don't know what it is. But uh, and the drugs are very helpful. Uh, you know, you have to manage the side effects uh, and especially the some of the newer drugs. But we've forgotten the, one of the most important things is psychotherapy and the new neuroscience shows that that's what's interesting to me about it is that we've gone back first from a psychoanalytic viewpoint which was unproven speculation to a everything's biology and now with biology showing the effects of psychotherapy on the brain on the physical on, on the physical aspects so uh, because everything you use the brain for changes it so it's changing all the time. So people say, like I wrote an article on my website about how the older brain of an active brain is better. I mean, the, the current prejudice is the old brain is demented. You know, that's the view of young people. And you, you lose capacity as you get older. But the truth of the matter is an older brain that's been studying and interested and active and doing meaningful things has many more circuits to the frontal lobe, many more circuits to the right and left connections. It's a far superior brain, except for one thing that makes everyone think that it's poor, and that is word finding. So it is true that word finding, so oh, what is that? Oh, tip of my tongue. Ah, uh, okay. So that stuff That's is a side effect. Greater, <laughs> and it makes people think that they're stupid. But the fact of the matter is the elder brain that's been active. Again, that's very important. That's been active in biology. You use it or you lose it. It's mm -hmm. been active and that uh, is actually better at pattern recognition, at understanding situations, what we used to call wisdom, you know, right. it, it's gone out with the, with the young. Uh, There's another reason for you guys to want to become generalists, not just for a career perspective, but for your brain, for, for uh, keeping it sharp. It's like a muscle. You gotta, you got you gotta exercise right. it. Uh, sure. so you think we're closer to, do you, do you think we're further ahead in Alzheimer's research than schizophrenia research? No, no, we don't Opposite. have any idea what Alzheimer's is. We, uh, we, wow. We, what's happened there is the amyloid people took over all the money. Right. And basically stifled everything else. And, and now it's the tau, right? Tau. Well, tau is very important. Amyloid is important, but is it a cause or an effect? It probably is an effect, not a cause. Mm -hmm. And there are many people with a lot of amyloid who do not have dementia. And that's the big problem with all this hoopla about amyloid. Um, but you, microglia are vital. The immune situation is vital. The astrocytes are vital. The reaction of all the cells uh, in the milieu uh, is is vital to it. Um, cholesterol, the the way it's cut, the way the membrane works, mm. the way the uh, is vital. So cholesterol, what's very important about cholesterol, I don't know if people don't know this probably, it's in my book though, is it it's it's a shape fitting molecule that uh, that makes certain specific membrane shapes. So the way you need a my uh, a mitochondria needs a curve. Uh, a neuron needs a specific shape for something. Um, cholesterol, along with many, many other phospholipids, creates, they build shapes by putting in these various membranes. And when you have alterations of cholesterol, you change the angle slightly and you cut the amyloid in a slightly different way. And that's why the lipoproteins are important. But um, how they're carried, you know, so that's why the the apo thing is is relevant. But that, but there are many other genetic aspects to this, and the truth is, uh, it's too complicated right now. <laughs> but we're not looking at all of it holistically. We're looking in a very narrow way at amyloid, and that's really unfortunate. Wow, you, <laughs> what's your favorite cell? Well, it changes sometimes. Well, I mean, I'm so delighted with the platelet and the capillary cells, but <laughs> cancer, cancer is an amazing cell. Uh, the microglia is an amazing cell. Mm. Um, the choroid is an amazing cell. 
And of course, you have uh, viruses and microbes. And no, I, I love a lot of them. What, the, the way you structured the book, you have part one, the body. <clears throat> you said you did this intentionally. Um, so part one, the body, or section one, the body. Section two, the brain. Section three, the world of microbe communication, uh, which I, I talked to some doctors doing it. Uh, microbiome research and they're saying hey this is like the second brain but then you're saying the whole body's the brain so forget that theory and then section four conversations inside cells why did you structure it that way and the last chapter the case for mTOR well the I mean I had to structure it somehow mm -hmm. and clearly I'm making the case that there's no separation between brain and body but you have to talk about them so <laughs> right so I start with cells that we conventionally think of as not being the brain, uh, you know, the, the white blood cell traveling, the capillary cell calling for it, the T cell, the master cell, the skin. I chose skin and gut as two examples of cells that are, and, and those are the most amazing cells also. They, like one layer of cell in the gut has trillions of microbes on one side and immune tissue on the other side and neurons on the other side and it has to make sense of all this communication and it has to choose uh, friendly microbes that come near the mucus and near the edge and uh, bring their friendly uh, phage viruses also mm -hmm. that attack uh, pathogenic mm -hmm. microbes they have to choose the ones that are going to help make uh, nutrition they also have to deal with t-cells to not attack creating a uh, food allergy food allergies, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and then the brain, I talk about each of the cells, and then there's the chapter on inflammation and pain and the neuroimmune. Um, so it's just a way to talk, but it's clear in the, in the, I refer back and forth all the time. And then in the microbe section, I have a chapter on microbes in the gut uh, and microbes in the brain. And, uh, you know, the, how the amazing world of microbes, how smart they are, what they do, and then viruses, how intelligent viruses are. Then, and then you're down pretty small there. So the question is, the viruses relate to the, the organelles, the mitochondria. Uh, and mitochondria, so yeah. So your that's, mitochondria. That's mitochondria the one is, that I, it's a bacteria. are fascinated. And it's a bacteria, right? That was trapped. Like, that's the theory I heard, right. like, in school, the bacteria got trapped and it became yep. part of the cell right but it's amazing life of, and 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 the stuff about uh how atp is made that's in my next book but right <laughs> now i talk about how the mitochondria talks to the cell through the endoplasm it docks it creates a dock and it sits there talking to the cell and where do we need energy and it's carried along the microtubule uh, pathways to where all along the axon. Uh, but so then I talk about the organelles, including uh, the dendrites, how they make uh, decisions and how, you know, one cell, one neuron, cells are very small. Cells are smaller in relation to us than we are to Mount Everest. I mean, it's very small. And yet one cell in the spinal cord sends an axon three feet to the toe and it has to service that axon and and fix it and that's why when you create metabolic disturbances it's the long nerves that go first because they just can't service it. they just can't get the materials there and the way they get the materials are through these microtubule and actin transport systems and one of the chapters is about that uh, and then i just throw in mTOR because it's amazing that a, a oh but it seems like these organelles talk to each other just the way cells talk to each other so it's it's lower down than just cells that are smart organelles do that and then we're just learning about that how all right. the signaling is going on between the lysozyme and the golgi and blah 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 and then but there's one particular molecule that seems to signal and creates a complex a molecule complex called the mTOR complex one and two, that is basically working with the lysosome to determine everything we need. It's just unbelievable. It measures the amino acids. It tells the ribosomes when we need more proteins. It goes and triggers the, 
the ribosome. It uh, determines when we need more sugars, or when, how much needs to be broken down versus how much needs to be built. One molecule does this. Wow. So to me, that molecule is mind boggling. And it's like, it's mTOR. as mind boggling as a cell being smart. Here you have a molecule that's smart. What, who makes the mTOR? Like where, where does that come from? mTOR is a small uh, kinase protein. It's a protein that phosphorylates, that takes phosphate, high energy phosphate molecules and glumps it on another molecule and creates reactions. So uh, basically everything runs through kinases. Uh, all of the ca cascading, uh, the signal hits the cell, it goes through a cascade and they compete. Then they end up with transcription factors in the genes and then they create. So all of that is through, I mean, the, not all, but most of it is through phosphorylation, They're using phosphates to change another molecule and create a reaction. And then this creates this. And this, creates this. So that's like and related to epigenetics somehow? Well, yes and no. Epigenetics is inside. Epigenetics does use enzymes. Enzymes take different tags and place them on both the DNA when it's open and can be reached or the, the spool that protects it, the histone, it tags those and those tags create meaningful effects. Either you can use it, you can't use it. Uh, it's harder to use it. You have to have certain things. So, so the tags, and there are now 40 of them, but the most important are methyl and uh, acetyl, um, basically pro-creating a protein, anti-creating a protein. But it's much more complicated. Than that. And they leave these markings. And some of the markings can go through um, cell division and be translated, you know, in, in heredity. So the enzymes are important for epigenetics. But what I was talking about, mTOR is in, not in the nucleus. It's up in the cytoplasm. And it's trying to figure out what is going on. But it then does affect the, the, the nucleus. It sends signals to the nucleus. But this is just a molecule. Wow. doing that so i don't that's mind-boggling to me so i just threw that in as the last chapter which is really the topic of my next book so basically you you structure this book from like bigger Large to, to small right. right yes and your exactly. next book's going to start from small to even smaller right i'm guessing yes and then get, <laughs> so and what's then the get, smallest thing that we know in the body like i mean well like, the smallest thing we know is that electrons move through channels that are basically wires and they have stations that are based upon specific chemical reaction uh, activity of metals like iron and and sulfur and the electrons move and as they move energy is taken from this the activated electron gradually and that's the life energy that we live on. And that moving electron creates the ability to make ATP, which is the chemical energy thing that's from the photon coming from the sun into the electron activated and moving. And the moving electron then transfers the energy into chemistry and the chemistry transfers it into a a machine, basically. It's a piston machine that makes ATP. Wow. <laughs> hey, you, what pre-interview I was asking you, would it be safe, fair to say the language of cells is chemistry? And you had a great answer. Can you share with the Guru Nation what you said? Yeah, well, chemistry is quantum mechanics because it's all based on the size of the electron orbitals that is determined by how many electrons, how many neutrons, how many protons, the shape and size of the atom creates the orbitals. And then the way they connect creates new complex kinds of orbitals. Uh, and those orbitals have chemical properties like to create a benzene ring, for example, which can interact with light or which can is kind of stable, but it has a free kind of electron cloud like a metal, it's a little bit like a metal in that way. Um, metals allow free movement of electrons. So, so you can't separate quantum mechanics from chemistry. And then chemistry uh, 
creates these large, huge molecules based upon the unique characteristics of the uh, of, of the atoms of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Each atom has a unique characteristic and creates these. So, like carbon, because it has four things and creates a structure of four directions and it's directional, it can create these large molecules that uh, have shape and, 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 that, um, and that's what all life is based upon is shape and connection of uh, the shapes of molecules and the interaction and how that changes things. But whenever anything happens, it's an electron moving. Right. Right. That, so it's electron bouncing here and there and being carried. Uh, I think what I find fascinating, and I mean, thank you for your time, and we got to do part two and three. But from what I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, but these things, no matter how small you get, nothing's ever really like truly connected. There's always a space somewhere in between. So like no matter how small you get, this is what I've got from the book so far. Like there's always space and that space is important, very important. That's where like the action where the rubber meets the road. Yes, we don't understand how this is all happening. There's no explanation for DNA, for the codes, There's <laughs> no explanation for how a cell in one part of the body could possibly know what they need from the bone marrow and, and what kind <laughs> of cell and how when that wow. cell and give it directions to travel against to do even, it. even wow. against the flow of blood and climbing uh, along the blood vessel and getting to the cell and then creating a channel, yes, go in there, and then yeah. start directing the cells to form certain formations. We have no idea how a cell can know how to do all that. The, the chapter on T-cells was fascinating. I, I didn't know that there was like a teacher T-cell that basically put the T-cell like, like the baby or like the junior T-cell like in a school, basically put them in a cocoon or something like a matrix and starts like sending them signals. So they start growing all these receptors. Right. They, they have a training. It's a university. And one of the cell, one <laughs> of the, <Harvard. laughs> yeah. And one of the mechanisms is the nurse cell, which you're describing, which is a very large cell that actually takes the, the baby T cell in and bombards it. There's no cell in the body that uses all of their genes because that's what differentiation, that's what makes the difference between a muscle cell and a brain cell. Right. is that it only uses X, Y, and Z and, and not A, B, C of the, of the genes. The nurse cell uses every single gene there is and throws all these uh, molecules at the T cell and sees if it can cope with it and handle it. And if it can't, it rejects it. And if it can, it moves to another station where they determine whether it's going to kill human cells or not. Mm. Whether it's whether it's sensitive enough to understand the balance of power and how they can fight against a cancer cell and a and a bacteria, but they're not going to kill uh, the neuron to, and create multiple sclerosis. So that it's an amazing story. Wow! And, uh, wow! Yeah, I love the T cell <laughs> chapter. Yeah, the T cell. Yeah, and I guess the last thing before we wrap up, uh, I was listening to a financial podcast. And they were talking about market valuations for companies and how basically what differentiates humans from all other animals is our ability to tell a narrative, uh, which I never really thought about. I mean, I guess you kind of understand. So we could basically tell ourselves a story, even if it's not true, and get people, get others to believe it. I'm wondering because you're in your book. The cells, and you don't need to have an answer for this. I'm just curious your take. The cells, and when you talk about checkpoint inhibitor, different things like that, are. do you think they're able to tell narratives to one another and false narratives to one well, another? Well, we, we do know that bacteria and even viruses ev create evasion techniques. Um, and so, for example, Ebola creates a decoy it, it has two different sets of molecules one that creates a, a set of proteins that it uses and the other is a decoy over here and it goes back and forth adding to the decoy adding to this and the cell attacks the decoy and not 
the useful part. And that's sort of what you're talking about. Uh, and how a virus can do that, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but bacteria do that also. All, and HIV, it, it evades all of the, the, the successful immune fighting vi viruses have evasion techniques that are extremely elaborate and involve, I mean, it's mind boggling, really. It's, it's unbelievable how HIV can take DNA. Uh, I mean, how, how viruses can have DNA and RNA in the cytoplasm and take it all the way down to the nucleus and not get attacked, you know, somehow get there. And they do that by covering it, by creating ships that, uh, that protect it, by going to the, the nuclear pore is, is unbelievably complicated. It's a wonderful structure and it has many, it's like the most elaborate harbor you can imagine. I mean, with all kinds of elaborate ways to signal what goes in and what doesn't go in and in and out. And, and yet these viruses trick the nuclear pore and get in there. Um, yep. <laughs> wow. I guess that's a good cliffhanger for the next uh, podcast. And I don't know when you're planning your next book, but everybody should definitely get this book. Let me pull it up on the screen again. Uh, the Secret Language of Cells. What Biological Conversations Tell Us About the Brain-Body Connection, the Future of Medicine, and Life Itself. There you go. $3.99 on Kindle right now. If you're watching in the future, sorry, you know, you missed out. That's why you got to subscribe, hit the bell button to get notifications. That's what you got to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leaf. I really appreciate it. Well, and look, definitely looking forward to having you on again, because I think we just scratched the surface of this. Excellent. Very nice to be here. And thank you, everyone, for watching, listening. If you want to get the book, link underneath and also Dr. Leaf's LinkedIn, or you prefer Twitter, right? Twitter, you're more active on Twitter. I'm more, I'm most active on Twitter. Yeah, I, yes, I, I do Facebook that. a little bit. Uh, I'm not on Instagram. Maybe I should, uh, mm. but I, um, I, I'm, I've been active on Twitter for Twitter for many years. Okay, I'll put the Twitter and the Twitter link and the Kindle or the Amazon link underneath the show notes. Thank you very much, Doctor Leaf. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. And we'll catch you all later. Bye bye.